Hi, I'm Kat, and welcome to my discussion leader workshop. Today we're going to be talking about a narrative of the life of Mrs. Mary Jemison. This text is filled with many crucial themes that I will discuss in a bit, and I found it to be very versatile yet conflicting in language. But mainly what I got from this text was not a story of good versus evil in regards to whites and Indians, but more of Mary's experience as a woman and the gender division that she experienced. So my main focus is going to be the contrast between white and Indian women in the domestic sphere. This theme is evident mainly in chapter 4 of the narrative where Mary explains the different labors that Indian women were expected to do and compares them to the labors that white women were expected to do. So in this chapter, Mary explains how men and women had different duties. It was the men's duty to protect the villages and the homesteads and the women to stay at home and prepare the food, raise the young and to participate in agricultural tasks. However, what got my attention was this quote from chapter four that reads, the Indian women have all the fuel and the bread to procure and the cooking to perform. Their task is probably not harder than that of white women who have those articles provided for them. So here Mary recognizes the labor division between white women and Indian women. Even though she notes that the work is difficult, she also mentions that it is enjoyable since they get to keep their children with them. This implies that they were all family oriented. All of the women worked together as a strong community. They even referred to each other as sisters and they raised each other's children in this environment. So Mary's saying like, yeah, the work was difficult, but at least I got to be with my children all day, whereas white women had to have someone take care of them while they worked. Mary also states in this quote that white women had some sort of advantage, um, that they had articles provided for them. She doesn't necessarily state what these articles were or what these advantages were, but she does suggest that white women had some sort of advantage. It could have been that they had the caretakers for their children and they were more distant with their children. It could have been that they had materials brought to them, but she does infer that women had some sort of advantage. This bottom quote is from the end of chapter four, and Mary concludes that she's very happy with the love and affection that she gained from these women. The quote says, the warmth of their feelings, the kind reception which I met with, and the continued favors that I received at their hands, riveted my affection for them so strongly that I am constrained to believe that I love them as I should have loved my own sister had she lived, and I had been brought up with her. So I would have to say from these two quotes that the biggest contrast between these two women were that Indian women were united not just by labor or their children but by the love that they gained for each other which is why I think Mary chose to stay even after she was set free and why she even referred to herself as adopted rather than captivated throughout the narrative. So on this next slide I want to get into my secondary source. Uh, so based on the different labor roles that we saw between the white and Indian woman, it is important to remember that the voice of a male white background narrator is present. Uh, according to Karen Oakes in her article, we planted, tended, and harvested our corn, gender, ethnicity, and transculturation in a narrative of the life of Mrs. Mary Jemison. She, she suggests that this white male editor is present, specifically in chapter four, where Mary is contrasting the labor roles of white and Indian women. And Oak recognizes that Seaver doesn't do this explicitly. He doesn't defend whites with the voice of Mary, but he, it is evident when there are two narrators. Specifically, Oak notes that it's evident if you are not a middle-class white audience. So when Seaver suggests that white women were provided for in some way and had some type of advantage, he gives a way that he brings in his own experience and knowledge of the way white women worked. There was no way for Mary Jeminson to have that knowledge because she didn't experience that. And it debunks his credibility because he mentions that none of this narrative is his and it's everything that Mary Jeminson told him, yet we find out that he brings in his own experience. Overall, though, Oakes wants to emphasize in her article that, specifically in chapter 4, where there is a confusion of narration, that the reader should focus on the female perspective of the life of Jeminson rather than the cultural aspect in her self-identification. 
So that concludes my presentation. These are the three questions that I am asking you guys to discuss. The first one asked, based on what we have discussed in previous readings about editors including their own narration and disrupting the entire truth of the narrator, do you view Seaver's interaction as problematic? Or was he helping Jeminson convey the differences between white and Indian women? Number two, do you believe there was harm in the captivity of Jeminson by the end of her narrative, even after she chooses to stay? Or do you believe there was value in her adaptation to an Indian woman lifestyle? And number three, do you agree with Oak's suggestion that this is a narrative of the female perspective rather than a cultural self-identification? Thank you.